So we did the product rule right there. That was our last rule that we wrote down. Let's do the sum difference rule. So we're going to have <clears throat> the sum. So first of all, why would this not make any sense? Why does that not make any sense right there? Isn't that a function and a vector? So we got a real function and a vector. So you can't add those two together. We can add two vector functions. I think I use v for our second. Yep. So v is our second curve, and u is our. So we have a u and a v. So what should the derivative of two curves added together be? 180. What? Yep. So hopefully, we can take the derivative separately, add them together. That is the way it works. Oh, man. So we have derivative u plus derivative of v. So that's the sum rule, and it works just as well with the difference. So it's the sum difference rule right there. That's plus or minus? That is plus or minus. And now there's two product rules because there's two vector products. There's a cross product and a scalar product. So we're going to look at both products. We did the dot product first. So what do you think this product might be? The result of a dot product is a number. So shouldn't we just get? So we should be getting a number at the end. So the way this one works is we're still going to have the product. I'm going to use primes here. Uh, so it'll be u prime dot v plus u dot v prime. So it's basically the product rule, except specifically it's a dot product rule. That's what's happening right here. Looks just like the product rule. So is that, there's a thing, such a thing as like that dot product rule and like quotient dot rule? And all so you that? can't divide vectors. There is no division. Oh. There is no division with numbers. We just pretend that there is. Well. There's multiplying by reciprocals. There is no quotients. So, can I hold that in the line? Very much. No, you will. Uh, subtraction is not an operation, neither is division. There's adding negatives and multiplying by reciprocals. So, why is it that society teaches it like that? Because, you know, in, even from like preschool. Because I mean, people are really bad at math. And people are rather negative. <laughs> oh, Clever. <laughs> All right. So this one is going to be u prime cross v plus u cross v prime. Uh, if you want my opinion on the educational system, I will tell you after I'm done recording. <laughs> no, you'll have to wait. All right. So those product rules should be no surprise. There's a dot product rule and the cross product rule. So they should be exactly what you expect. You have to be super careful with the cross product. The order is super important. So you can't just turn them around. What happens if you turn one of these around? Well, no, specifically, it's negative. So if you got the order wrong, you would get one or both of these terms as being the negative of what they should be. Which, which way are you meaning to get them um, switching? Are you talking about the U um, and the V, or are you talking about making a negative? So like that's not V oh. cross U prime plus V prime cross U. That would be the negative of what it should be. What if you did that and switch the sign, would you just get a bad answer still? So yes. You're doing double negative? You could compensate. You, you could turn them, you oh. could commute them and make them negative. And that would be right. Yes, that would, you'd be making it negative and then unnegative. Yeah, that's just one more operation. I recommend you don't try to spin them around and make them both negative <laughs> at the same time. You just keep the... Well, yeah, yeah, I was just, you know, I'm trying to understand it, so that's like kind of like a check for me to see yeah. understand it. Yeah, 
you can you can apply both of those at the same time. Yeah. Uh, so the order is important. This u cross v is not v cross u. So the order is super important on the cr on the cross product, not on the the up product doesn't care. Which is the up product up above, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And last up, uh, the one rule we haven't covered yet is a chain rule. <coughs> So let's write something that doesn't make sense, and then we'll write something that does make sense. So don't copy this down. I can need a third parenthesis. What is wrong with having the input for the u function be the v of t? It looks like there's just two inputs. Is a vector inside a vector? So the what? So t is a number. However, the output of v of t is a vector. So that'll be an n-dimensional vector. What type of inputs does the function u have? Numbers. There should be numbers or scalars. So we're trying to feed a vector into a function that's expecting a number. So it would be very, uh, this doesn't make any sense. This would be undefined. So we're not allowed to input a vector into a function that's expecting a scalar. What I can do is I could have a scalar function as my input. So this function f inputs a scalar and outputs another most likely different scalar. However, it's still a scalar. So our function is not consuming vectors, it's consuming scalars. So this does make sense to go u of f of t. What do you think the derivative of this should be? Too much thinking. Chain rule. There we go. So it probably should be u prime of the original f of t multiplied by what? Multiplied by f prime of t. Let's think about, uh, does this actually make sense? And that time prime at t is zero, that means uh, f of t was constant. Okay. So that's pretty. And if your input's constant, your output's constant. So in that case, we should get zero. Uh, so here we have a real number being fed into a, uh, in this case, it won't be a position, it'll be a velocity, but it'll still be a vector valued function. So this is a vector right here. What is. What type of uh, output will f prime of t have? So the original function was scalar valued. So what should the derivative of a scalar function be? Scalar. scalar. So what we have is a vector times a scalar, which is still a vector. So f of t will never be a power more than like x to the first? It it absolutely can be, yeah. Uh, but if it's like x squared, then you get like well, it would probably be t, t squared, so the derivative would be 2t. And so whatever scalar value you get, remember, you can always distribute it inside your vector. So whatever, if you're in three dimensions, you would have three coordinates you could distribute into. It just wouldn't, you wouldn't be distributing a constant, you'd be distributing a function. But mathematically, it works out the same. So that's our last derivative rule right there. Uh, you can't chain them the other way. You can't go f of v of t, because f is expecting numbers. A scalar says this input, so you can't chain them the other direction. This may be a stupid question, but all of these work in triangular, but do they work in polar? So n I haven't talked at all about polar vectors yet. Okay. So these are all uh, rectangular coordinates. Uh, there is one of these that only works in three dimensions. Which one of these only works in three dimensions? The cross. Cross product. So that's the only one that requires us being in three dimensional space. All the other ones, dot products can be two dimension, three dimension, four dimension, or whatever dimension you're in, but cross products only exist in three. So 
we're going to look at a special type of vector function. And this type will be of constant length, also known as magnitude. So our favorite constant value is generally 1. So let's look at uh, vector functions that always have a magnitude 1 output. So if your vector function has constant length, that means if you took the magnitude of it, it would always be the same number. So that's what it means for a vector function of constant length. Uh, let's go back to R of T notation for our curve R of T. So if I square it, I'll get c squared. And the reason this will be more useful, the magnitude squared is the same as dot product with itself. So that's one other way to write magnitude squared right there. Uh, you can see that really easily. Does anybody need more details on why the magnitude squared is the dot product? with itself. OK. Now we're going to take a derivative and see what we get. What rule do I need on the left side? The left side? Yep. You can just uh, name that operation, and you'll be correct. Product the dot product rule. Yeah. Or you can say the product rule, as long as you know the product you're referring to is a dot. So take the derivative here. Use a dot product rule. Remember, this is not r squared. There is no, you can't multiply a vector by itself. So you, it doesn't make any sense to write a vector squared or to any other power. There are two products, a dot and a cross. That's it. So apply that dot product rule that we had. It's up a tiny bit on the notes. I'm not going to go up to it. So there's my dot product rule, r prime dot r plus r dot r prime. Uh, what's the derivative of c squared? Zero. Yep, it's a constant. Genius. So dot product is commutative, so I really have two of the same thing added together. So I got two of these, two r r prime equals zero, so that means r and I have a dot product here. You could write up t of t. So if your function has constant magnitude, then the function dot product with its derivative will always equal 0. So that's what we just derived right here. Geometrically, what type of vectors have a dot product of 0? It's close. Perpendicular. Oh, perpendicular. Or orthogonal. Normal. <laughs> so what this tells us, the function is always perpendicular or orthogonal to its velocity or its derivative. So let's suppose we're in two dimensions, so I can actually draw. And every vector that has a, oh, it's supposed to be a circle. That's even worse.
So this radius will be C. So if you plotted out this curve, it's a little boring, but every point in the curve would exist, uh, would be in, on the circle as well. So this curve will be tracing somewhere around the perimeter of the circle. So let's say this is right here, R of T for some T value. So the vector has length c right here. There's two types of vectors. There's basically two vectors that would be perpendicular to this. Well, really only one type. They would live on that line right there. So that line's perpendicular to our vector. So whatever the derivative is, is going to either point up to the left or down to the right. It's got to live in this line somewhere. It's also possible that at zero, for example, if your uh, position doesn't move, so maybe your particle got to that spot and is sitting there for eight seconds, your derivative will be zero. So you could have a zero derivative. Uh, very soon we're going to assume that our uh, curves are never stationary, so the particle is always moving. Uh, so if we assume the particle is not stationary, meaning the derivative is not zero, that means R prime, I'll use, let's go. Velocity is green, is that right? Yeah. Blue. Blue? Uh oh. Acceleration is green. Okay. Doesn't really matter. So R prime either points this direction or the other direction. Does it have to be coming off that end point or can it be You could redraw it wherever you want. So it could be drawn there. Uh, you could technically draw it like way over here, but that's kind of silly. It's not. There's no point to do that. Is uh, the velocity supposed to be following the um, blue axis? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, I did. So those are your two possibilities for your derivative. It either points, uh, it's always going to be parallel with the circle, but either points one direction or the other, depending on which way uh, you are moving. So this is the last topic from 13.1. Now we're going to move to 13.2. So 13.1 was all about derivatives. And now we're going to look at antiderivatives or integrals. So this big R, this is a function of t. R of t is an antiderivative of little r of t if, so fill in the blank. Make this sentence true. So your sentence should involve one derivative and an equal sign. So write down what does it mean for big R to be the antiderivative of little r. And don't use antiderivative. That's what we're trying to define right now. We don't know what the antiderivative is. So you'd be the antiderivative if the derivative of big R is little r. So that's what it means to be the antiderivative. Oh, yeah. If the derivative is on the other side, it would just be the derivative of. If I move the derivative on the other side, it would just be the derivative of little r. So that's exactly how we defined it. We just used letters F and capital F before. So this is antiderivative. 
I can make, uh, because we're dealing with factors now. Okay. Before is f of x, now it's r of t. Yeah, and we use capital F, too, so it was exactly the same uh, thing going on. Okay. So we could write integral r, r of t dt, equals big R of t. If it's indefinite, we're going to get a plus constant, just like we got before. So that's why I said an antiderivative, not the antiderivative. So there's infinite antiderivatives. They all differ by a constant, just like before. However, there's one uh, thing you have to be aware of. What type of constant is this? The vector constant. A constant is a vector. Doesn't make sense to add a number to R of t, so c is now a vector. So c is an Rn. So it's now a constant vector. So you have to pay attention to what type of uh, what type of object you're working with, if it's a vector or a number. So let's do a fast example. So we got cos t i plus j minus 2tk. Remember, ijks are constant uh, vectors, constant placeholders. So take your best guess at the antiderivative, and then check if you're correct. You know how to take derivatives. So we're doing guess and check. Guess what you think the antiderivative is, and then see if you're actually right. You can write in diamond notation or IJK. I'll do the middle term. I'm going to guess T. You can do the other two terms. So here's my guess, sine t, t, negative t squared. So now we're going to do the checking part. So I want to know, does r prime equal my original function? So I'm just taking derivative, derivative of sine cos, derivative t is 1, derivative of negative t, negative 2t, or negative t squared is negative 2t. So there's my r prime. Is that the original? Yes, it is. I could write IJK notation. If I did that, I'd have cos t i plus 1j, or just j, minus 2tk. So that's my original right there. So this is an antiderivative. How would I write this so it is all the antiderivatives? The RRT would have a plus c. Plus c. And so we know that this plus constant is a vector constant. And when I take my derivative, why does it disappear? Because any derivative of a constant vector is zero. Yep, derivative of constants are zero. And that's true in vectors, just like it is in uh, scalars. So there is every antiderivative, and we just checked right there. So that was an indefinite integral. Let's look at a definite integral now. So if we had a to b, uh, little rt dt. So if you knew the antiderivative was big R, what would you then have to do? So if you knew the antiderivative, that's not the entire definite integral, but that's the, the calculus part of it. What else do we have to do? R of b minus R of a. So we've got to plug in the two n values. So we're going to eventually do R of b minus R of a. So we write it as R of t from a to b with that vertical bar. And this is 
big R of B minus R of A. So that's how we're going to do definite integrals. We'll do an example now. So we'll go 0 to pi. Let's do the exact same function we just looked at, which is cos t 1 negative 2t. So you know the antiderivative. You just have to plug in the two endpoints and subtract. Any questions on this antiderivative? So I shortcutted, just wrote 0 for the 0 vector that was right there. Most of the time, your vector is not going to be 0, 0, 0. This is just a lucky uh, coincidence. So most of the time, you'll actually have to compute your last vector and subtract it out. We just got lucky, and it was 0 this time. So that won't always happen. Yeah. Yeah, if we had cosines down here, they would not be they would not be zero. So don't assume your second vector is gonna be zero. Sometimes it is, most of the time it's not going to be. So our next example. Suppose you know the acceleration that a plane experiences. This is an airplane, not a two-dimensional plane. So this might be gathered from uh, some type of black box that sees the uh, movement of the airplane, or maybe if somebody's cell phone is firmly attached to the uh, metal of the airplane, you might be able to detect it on the phone. But suppose you know the acceleration airplane experiences, and this acceleration is the function, I'll use a of t for the acceleration, minus 3t cos t minus 3, it was just minus 3 cos t minus 3 sine t, negative 2. So the plane crashed at time 0. At location Three two five. Find the R of T function. So we have information about the acceleration. How in the world do I recover the position? 
we're going to take the antiderivative. We have to go two of them because the first one will get us to velocity and the second one will get to position. So we got two antiderivatives to take. So let's write uh, v of t is going to be the integral or antiderivative of a of t. And we can write that down. So take this antiderivative. It should be pretty easy to take. Make sure you have a plus constant. And we're in three dimensions, so I'll call the constant ABC. This is going to be the plus C, except now it's a, a, a three vector. And the way I always do antiderivatives with trig is I just guess, and then I check. I generally just write them all positive, and then if they need to be negative, that's what I do in the checking phase. So the first one needs to be negative, and the second one becomes negative on its derivative. So the second term doesn't uh, get a negative sign. All right, so antiderivative questions. How in the world do I figure out a, b, and c? So I need to assume that the plane wasn't moving when it crashed. So I could assume, well, this would be like at the moment that it impacted. It would be going whatever velocity. So I need to know the velocity it actually had when it hit the ground. So we'll need that information. I didn't write that down. I'm worried if I just make something up, it'll be really horrible. So we said t equal to 0, and a, b, and c would then be 3, 2, and 5? Well, I, the problem is I don't know what v of 0 is. So I can do I can plug in zero on the right side. I don't know what vector that would equal on the left side. Uh, well, let's just plug it in, and then I'll make up some numbers that work. No, I will give you all the information. Hopefully. Or else you would just say that's a velocity and I don't know A, B, and C because you didn't tell me any information. Well, I mean, you just plug in some numbers that you Well, I'm not just plugging in some numbers. I'm plugging in the only time value we know anything about. I, we could say probably the altitude would be zero if you're crashing, depending on what you would consider zero to be. All right, let's go with, uh, let's do. 10, 10, 10. Sure, that works. So back in the problem. And impact velocity. It's probably not that accurate if, unless we're in uh, some pretty serious units, because that's not a very fast crash if we're in like miles per hour. That's not, not the hardest airplane crash ever. <laughs> Yeah, it would probably get <laughs> off the ground. I'm sure it would cause some damage, but that wouldn't be horrible, horrible. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's, I, I wasn't thinking an RC plane. I should have been. All right, so we know that we're crashing at 10, 10, 10. So that's the left side. And the right side, I'm going to go ahead and add these vectors together. We have 0 plus A, 3 plus B, and 0 plus C. So you should be able to tell A, B, and C right away. I, you know what? I'm going to do my arithmetic outside the vector. So 
So I'm going to solve for the ABC vector. So I'm going to do my arithmetic this way, right here. You can do your arithmetic inside the vector, or you can do it outside the vector. As long as you're careful about what you're doing, it should work either way. I just subtracted the 0, 3, 0 vector to the other side. So that's our constant right there. So now I can write down properly the full v of t. So v of t was that negative 3 sine t, 3 cos t, negative 2t, plus 10, 7, 10. And you could write this as one vector. 10 minus 3 sine t, 7 plus 3 cos t, and 10 minus 2t. Ooh, I made a big mistake on those numbers. Our y velocity probably should be negative. <laughs> Unless we're crashing on the other side of the flat Earth. Let's just say that. We're crashing on the bottom of the flat Earth. So we're in Australia. <laughs> so we're in Australia. <laughs> Earth's flat, so. Hey, you're just on the other side. We're no crashing big deal. into the ceiling of a cavern. Yeah, or you're inside. You're, you're flying through a cave. For yeah. Play with your RC we're definitely plane with the with RC plane, plane <laughs> if we're flying in a cave. <laughs> RC plane in college. Hit the ceiling. Those RC planes can be expensive. Better than flying a real airplane through a cave. <laughs> <laughs>